Once I stood at the foot of a great high mountain that I wanted so much to climb. And on top of this mountain was a beautiful fountain and beside it the tree of life. I fell down on my knees at the foot of this mountain Cried out, Odin, what must I do? I want to climb up and see Want to learn from this tree That grows so clear in my view top of this mountain saying child these are my rooms just start with Fehu and climb on upward between the etheric and root Odin's advice and the higher I got the harder I climb symbiosis I farm and live free climbing higher each day by the alchemist way so friend if you're willing climb this mountain with me
side Little woman, my horses won't stand Jack and I'm a Jack and I'm a I've known you from all you robbed my poor pockets of my silver and my gold. She's a pretty bird, she wobbles as she flies, she'll cause you no trouble, and she'll tell you no lies. Hail, and welcome to Bedtime Stories, where Ben and Lucas have our biochemical electrical, uh, biochemical electrical discussion, and we go ahead and further the uh, galvanic world model that uh, we've been working on, and also this week we have an uh, excellent congratulations. Lucas uh, had a fantastic episode that dropped with Crow, that if you have not seen that, uh, go ahead and go check out uh, Lucas's episode with Crow. And he also started a Rockfin channel. So everybody go ahead and go over and check out the Rockfin where he also premiered his new video. So well done and total Lucas fashion in a way that I can't do it uh, with the computer -y, The Everything looks really good. But uh, how you doing, Lucas? I'm good, mate. Thank you for that introduction. You betcha. You bet. Thank you for the excellent episode of Crow. That was most enjoyable. Yeah. Um, like I told you, I basically, I had a heap of notes. I'd been working on it for ages. And then I got into the into the interview, <laughs> I'm like about half an hour in, not even that. I'm like, fuck, throw away the notes. <sighs> just, just wing the rest. Yeah. Um, Crow. So. Absolutely. Crow is the deep end of uh, deep end of the pool. There is no two ways about it. You uh, you go in there with this whole thing that you've got worked out in your head, and like you said, just shortly into it, you're like, "Yeah, that's gone. I, there's no recovery." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, you but bet. anyway, I, I, I think it went out went all right. Um, it, it went so fast, you know. It was like by the end of yeah. the two hours or whatever, I'm just like. Cause it was 5 a.m. in the morning and he was lucky to get two words out of me. I was just like, <laughs> what the, what the fuck just happened? You know? But, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, half the time, the ones that I think are the worst are the best. And it is, it's because right after I'm done, I'm like, what did I just say? Like yeah. what exactly that feeling that what just happened? Uh, I was, I was so, trying to go back in my mind. I was like, well, "Yeah, I covered that. Covered. I think I covered most of it." So, you know, that was the main bet. thing. As long as I got a, a few of the major points out there, but um, yeah, it's oh, such absolutely. a complicated. It, it really is a complicated um, subject to actually talk about, and that's why I find yeah. most difficult trying to simplify it, trying to make it approachable for most people. But it's it still has its complications obviously and and i'm still learning as i go and still researching and you have stuff to deal with like you know um where you get your information from or 
what things to look at. So I'm always trying to look at stuff that um, that we use, you know, that's functional, and um, and, and that gives me a basis to actually work from. Um, so. Yeah, but it's it's just a fascinating sort of um, worldview that sort of it keeps building upon itself, and it's, it's showing new little things to me every time. And um, I've sort of moved on a little bit from the, the the galvanic setup. I mean, that's there, but you know, now I'm trying to look at other elements surrounding it, um, how the processes are working, and things like that. And that's, um, you know, I'm just a newbie at a lot of this stuff as well. So it's, it's just like going through bulk information and trying to find, um, you know, little bits of stuff that that's appropriate, appropriate. Yeah. Well, and then, and then the thing that Lucas and I do a lot is then also match it up to the old uh, stories, the old myths and whatnot. And that's where a lot of the keys to these things are always hiding. It's just figuring out what that was saying and uh, it's just amazing once you start putting all this together. And like Lucas said, well, it's rather simple. It's also horribly complicated while you're figuring it out. It's just getting that simplified version uh, worked down and uh, out to the people, out to where you can explain it. Um, it it's such a long and tedious process. And, and you guys have no idea the weird hours that Lucas and I have conversations because we're consistently sending each other messages all day and night because we live mm -hmm. in different continents. Um, and uh, the weird science that him and I are always all day, every day looking at and figuring out and just figuring out the way all these pieces interact with each other. Um, mm -hmm just a crazy process but with that lucas has uh uh sketched out a real nice basic drawing and uh we're gonna go ahead yep. and look at that and then also uh spend a little bit of time talking about the the mercury component of things um next month mm -hmm. i've got uh uh clive de carl and uh, amanda volmer coming on at the same time i think we're going to try and hit sulfur up from the human body and try and hit that hard and i'd like to definitely talk about the sulfur component here shortly and like next month you know after the new year or something but right now we're working on mercury a bit and uh here's lucas's fantastic drawing go ahead and uh take it over lucas well i done this this morning it was it's a sort of a it's, I try to keep it as simple as possible, and um, it, it's pretty rough, let's face it. Um, so, I don't know. Basically, where you want to start is, you know, we've got the four elements, um, which is part of the galvanic cell, and, um, you know, you've got the anode, which would be the negative side, negative portion of the negative terminal, and then you've got the cathode, the sun, which is your positive terminal, um, you've got the salt bridge, which is the earth. Um, and then you've got the electrolyte, which is your ocean. So that's your basic um, galvanic cell, although it's, you know, the, the operations is simple enough when you put it into distillation, the understanding of distillation. And it's really the sun's action on the oceans, basically lifting up the spirits of the salt if you want to put it in alchemical terms. And then those are getting lifted up, swirled around by the world winds and then um, creating this upper atmospheric electrolyte. And, you know, what I was just saying, on, I got a telegram group and I was just saying on that, um, that everything's basically running off this principle of, of gradients or principle of, um, of the Trinity, really which is two polarities and then you have that midpoint and it's you've got pressure gradients you've got electrical gradients and insulators and you've got all these different gradients just happening at once and it's um really just a fascinating to put it in that light once you have that trinity concept sort of in your mind then you you're sort of just asking the questions about you know these gradients of what's happening and so recently, I guess most people are sort of um, understanding this galvanic cell plus the thermogalvanic cell, which is based on hot and cold. 
um, which is just a differential between say the cold moon and the hot sun. So you're going to have energy moving towards those, but um, yeah, mainly I've been looking at sort of different ideas about levitation um, and also looking at uh, particle accelerators and um, what else were we talking about? Radioactivity. Yeah, a whole lot of talk about the radioactivity and how uh, things are uh, transitioning where they're, uh, and then understanding that uh, as they decay, it turns into an entirely different thing, supposedly, which just is the um, depletion of ions uh, out of the material, yeah. uh, which means so very much when you understand it. And then you, if you start looking at the, uh, outer planets and you look at them in the galvanic cell uh, where the plates have to feed the uh, anode and the cathode um, and then that's what distributes it to us then uh, that's very interesting when you look at it that way uh, yeah what well, those the, would possibly be doing when we're looking at radioactivity or even like particle accelerators you know that's where they're creating this um, transmutation and that's one of mm -hmm. been one of the focuses I've had, especially when looking at the periodic table and trying to put this together. It's like, well, you know, how are these elements created? And, um, you know, we've got them all in the periodic table. It's almost like they're all little separate elements. But, you know, I'm trying yeah. to look at more like the alchemical way, which was like, okay, so it's it's a gradient of elements. It's not just one little separate element. It's like they're all created um, via different actions, basically. And I was trying to get to the, the heart of that. That's why I always try and go back to the um, alchemical viewpoints because they're much more holistic. You know, they're not trying yeah. to divide everything up. They're like, well, they're so much more holistic. And you know that with, you know, whatever they're talking about whether it's the seasons or um you know just living with nature and that sort of thing that they've got a, a much better approach than than what we do in the modern day and um so that's that's just been well, i always trying to fall back on that you know well and it's getting to that understanding of the original base prematuria prima materia and understanding that that original base prima materia was broken down and it's everything else is derived from that broken down prima materia and it's just a combination of the pieces of that original prima materia is what's giving us the different things that we're calling elements and all that is is a transition of either you know protons electrons um and how and that's all it is they lose a couple here all of a sudden it turns into this and you can start seeing that well with the particle accelerator obviously the decay is an easy is a fairly easy side as is electrolysis where you're breaking it apart and you're decaying things getting them to go back together into uh the other side and go the other direction with it that's an entirely different story um and it would appear that that's much that must be what they're trying to do with that accelerator is is trying to reverse that process yeah well the the prima materia is really interesting because it's it's sort of what they based everything on it's 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 coming from a holistic one thing and and looking that you know this one thing then div divided itself and all these actions happened to create the world rather than you know science today looks at every single little bit and divides it up into little segments and says well this is this and has no relation to this mm -hmm. but the alchemists always sort of realized that there was you know the one creator the one one thing which everything came from you know and then from that sort of germination the the world was born which is really out of that polarity um you know and we can see it here um I'll go into a little bit, but, you know, you have this, we're looking at mainly like a, a positive uh, upper atmosphere, and then you have, say, a, neg a negative surface value of the of the earth and the oceans, and so you have that polarity going that way, plus, the, you know, the sun and the moon, their polarity. You have uh, 
low pressures when you go high, and then you have the the higher pressures when you get lower. Um, you have a a more acidic up the top, um, as opposed to the oceans, which are more alkaline in nature. Um, so you can see all these gradients are uh, at work, and then you have in the salt bridge. I, I basically see matter as being conjoined of um, positive and negative so it's it's in essentially a neutral that's why it wants to sit where it is in that dielectric plane whereas you know the upper atmosphere is sort of highly polarized in a sense and um, you know much more um, conductive you know as soon as you lower the pressure um, you you refine the airs it's acting very similar to a a vacuum tube, um, you know, just a low can pressure you, valve. Uh, can you take and center this picture perfectly and then pull up a picture of a cross and overlay that over top of it? That's something you can uh, do. Cross. Because the way you got that drawn is so perfect. So people understand what mercury actually is. Do we? So people mm -hmm. understand, like, you know what I'm saying? And you can see the <clears throat> as you as you cross like that. Yeah, you betcha. That's so perfect the way you've got that set up, where people can see what uh, that cross is. Why mercury, the mercurial figure, whether it's Hermes with his uh, yeah so staff the, you, that yeah, has mercury. the same thing. Yeah, yeah, um, right there. Yeah. So and that's, uh, and that's what it represents. It re represents this communication, doesn't it? It's the communication mm -hmm. between, you know, your topper, uh, top atmosphere and, and the bottom. And yeah, so it, it's really this mercurial point is sometimes, you know, related to Polaris, which everything is centered around. But it, it, once you understand where Mercury is, it, it, it is sort of everywhere there is a polarity. So yeah. you can find it everywhere. Well, and you that's, can even that's... see right here the crossroads. Which side are you going to choose? The masculine, the feminine, which one? The chaotic or the the ice? You know, and no matter how you look at it, and that's the crossroads right there. There's uh, the paths of Mercury that are available right there. It's it's uh, the whole story right yeah. there. Well, that's right, mm -hmm. and. Yeah, that, that's basically. But when we're looking at the metal as well, of of the actions of the metal, it's it's doing the same thing. It's amalgamating. It's part of the the sun and the moon. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know. So. Well, and then making yeah, that available to the earth. After it collects those things, that's where it uh, collects the uh, the horns, the the horns of the cow, and all that, and then takes it down to the cave, which is Earth, and then. So after mm -hmm. it collects those, amalgamates them, then it has to go down to Earth and do its job there and take that energy down to Earth. You betcha. Yeah. So yeah, you know, basically what we have is you know these the sun's coming down, heating up the oceans. the The spirit of the the of the oceans is getting lifted up swirling around in the winds and there's also this um electrostatic precipitation um which is only sort of new to me but it, it's basically being able to separate airs um via um you know a positive and negative charge so down here would be your negative and up here's your positive so there's a electrolytic sort of precipitation that's happening as well so you've got the condensing it's based on the, the uh, cooling and the heating and everything because as things cool and heat and break apart everything kind of has different weights and different ways that they react they're gonna uh condense back together at different uh temperatures different conditions and so that's one of those things where you set that up and then at the different gradients as lucas is talking about each level is going to predominantly have more of a thing in there because that's now that it's broken apart they're going to separate out and Yep. I'm just trying to find a pencil. Uh, hold on. I really liked what you were doing with the with the uh the bright blue that was super easy to see and it was really nice. What about this one? Red. Talking. That one's a good one. Yeah. That's a good one. So 
sometimes it just doesn't want to <laughs> delete. So, yeah, this is, well, where else do you want to go? There's high voltage, extreme high voltage, and that's there's like three different types of levitation that are occurring as well. Um, so with this, um, I've said it's solid oxygen, but it could be just multiple elements as well. But once they get to ex this extreme low temperature, they just basically, these gases turn into a, a solid and they're super conducting. And that means they also basically um, reflect or, um, yeah, basically reflect the, the ma electromagnetism and keep it bound within this. And so there's mm. none, none escaping. And, th and that's really sort of um, speaks volumes to this enclosed system um, and no energy gets in or out. And that's a really important concept, I think, um, to have this... Um, you know, a, a world that has is just energy circulating and then changes within it rather than this external. I'm really not really concerned about what, what's outside the dome or whatever it is. It's as far as I'm concerned, it's you're basically going into timelessness. And so, you know, one there's non action. Um, so yeah, so you got the extreme high voltage, um, up and upper atmospheric electrolyte as i said it's it's really based on this um distillation process where you're getting the refined materials coming up and that's and then under low pressure and it exa acts exactly like a um a vacuum tube and that allows communication allows charge to move and so that high voltage is with this um, sort of superconducting dome is basically how they create a um, particle accelerator. You know, they're, they're zooming particles around in a an enclosed environment, which is super, it's got a um, magnetic field as well as a um, uh, superconductors. So that's why I was looking at that as an example. Um, and that's where they actually start to, <coughs> do the transmutation like they can transmutate uh, lead into gold or mercury into gold elements via that and so that's why we're sort of looking at it and then we're also looking at say you know uh, these large radio telescopes you know that they've got they're like fucking massive but they're yeah they must be able, they must be able to you know really have a, a good uh, look at what's going up above us, you know. So, yeah. Did you? Uh, that's one of the other things, Lucas. Lucas and I don't think at all that we have this entirely figured out. So we've been. Uh, so we consistently are looking at new things and trying to work things out and uh, whatnot. Did you see that oct that octa uh, octa decan? That uh, I sent you. What was it? Check was it, it out. That list of stuff? That out? Yeah. We're at the, I did, but that I, did, I didn't know what it was. Where the boiling yeah, point's uh, 316 degrees, and then it's uh, got 60,523 structural <laughs> isomers. Like, and it's an actual solid, even at normal state. Oh, wow. That's insanity. Which, if you imagine that at uh, around the world where it's uh, around the whatever this is, you'd call this, it'd really make it very octahedron. That's that's really interesting. <clears throat> um, so the other thing, so I get there's a lot of things um, people saying, you know, and the moon's plasma and things like that. So I want to want to talk on that a little bit. I mean, you can't have. Um, a solid plasma, <laughs> you know? So, um, sorry, I got a child banging on the window. Anyway, um, <laughs> a plasma, <laughs> hurry up. Anyway, children. Um, so basically, uh, you know, they're saying, oh, the moon's plasma and all that sort of stuff. Um, and and really, plasma is the fourth state of matter. So it's above air, and it, it's basically becoming um, hyperconductive. Uh, and it is, <laughs> in, in all sense of the terms, it's a fire element. 
and and then they're saying well you know the moon is plasma and it's like well you know if you've ever tried to take a picture of plasma or air or something like that it, it's not going to be the same day after day you know what i mean it's um mm-hmm. we're right looking at the moon we're looking at a structure it's un, undeniable because you can go out there you know night after night take a picture of it and you're seeing the same structures it's not moving around and all that sort of stuff so i i just find these um probably just a misunderstanding on on what plasma is but in general i would say the the yeah the right is is um producing um ionic winds well the the sun would be producing a plasma as well so that would be the the external you, you have to have you know a, a something solid or some type of matter for the plasma to adhere to you can't just have it in mid space floating around and you know being held together um it needs needs to be sort of bound to matter in a sense and that's what we see whenever people create plasmas in vacuum tubes or whatever it is you've always got a metal component in there that you know is is either attracting that plasma from the anode or whatever it is but it's it's bound to it mm. and so you know you're going to have a, a in when you're looking at a um the sun as a cathode it's producing hydrogen um there's there's sulfurs and things like that and you really need three things to create a plasma and that means you need sort of a low pressure environment you need a magnetic field and you need temperature heat and so once you've got those three things present then a, a plasma can form and so that's exactly what you've got when you're looking at the sun you know um you're, See, you're I, basically I, yeah i wouldn't necessarily word it that the sun is creating hydrogen but that the sun is is uh it through this because the distillation process is on the right hand side where we have the heat and heat is what breaks things apart and hydrogen uh being extraordinarily light and singular that's your first element um that's breaking apart everything through this distillation process until it gets down to just hydrogen and the hydrogen reactions, what's happening at the sun, um, where the sun's going to be surrounded then with hydrogen, this area, and that's where that uh, reaction is yeah. going to be driven. As it, opposed a, to on yeah. the moon side, where it's going to be flooded in oxygen, because then through the cooling and the electrostatic settling, where the things are starting to settle back down, that's going to be flooded with oxygen, which is a much heavier element than uh, uh, hydrogen, much heavier. And drawn to entirely different things, the moon's going to be your base side, and it's going to be it's going to degrade rather than and uh, f- be more fission rather than fusion. So the oxygen is being drawn, and the anode itself is being flooded in oxygen, and the cathode is being flooded in hydrogen. Yeah, well, hydrogen really is like a, a <laughs> decomposition sort of product, right? In a sense, right. The so, finest of the decomposition products. It's it's what the finest element yeah. coming out of that out of that. Yep. Yeah, and you know, this is one of those things that it does go back to the heliocentric model. People, you know, um, calling the the sun this like burning hydrogen and things like that, and when. The thing I say to that is that yeah, you can't hide everything, especially if you've got mm-hmm. mechanisms for viewing stuff. Um, you know, they may tell us it's 93 million miles away, which is unverifiable. But when you've got, see, looking at the um, sun with a hydrogen alpha telescope. Not only is it unverifiable, at- it's not even graspable. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. honestly, that they've they've set things out at such an insane uh scale that the human mind can't even truly grasp that at all yeah and and the other thing is it's got like when you're looking at what i'm presenting i'm saying well you know this is the representation um you've got a battery you've got electrolysis you've got 
um, maybe a cyclotron happening. You've got uh, multiple different sort of examples, um, like the the vacuum tubes, how light's created. You know, even your light bulb. You know, multiple different examples of correlations of stuff we use. Whereas when you look at their their system, it's like, you know, what have you given us? You know, we've still got this technology that we use, but it's got nothing to do with your fucking model. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. it's it's pretty ludicrous at this stage. I mean, yeah, the that's fact why that I, nothing I don't even in the really model be reproduced about, you know. in a lab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, try try and get your you know your bowl to you know hold water. Yeah, they still haven't even showed us that you know stuff like that. It's just it's just crazy. No matter how big um, the ball is and how small the water particles are, nothing that particular bullshit mm. never works. <laughs> mm. Yeah, and then you know isn't that I'm why it supposedly showing... sticks? Because the Earth's so big and these particles are so small that we stick to the Earth through its pull because it's so much bigger than us that they can't reproduce that type of situation in any scenario yeah and i'm supposedly upside down compared to you i mean it's just it's just <laughs> no, that's why i really don't focus on it that much because it, it it's really basic at this stage i mean you know you don't need that many examples really i only use like three which is you know um water's level <laughs> I mean, that's all you need, honestly. Yeah. Uh, well, and and, and, and then, it's what eighty percent of the Earth is water, and it, so that means it's all eighty percent on a level. You can't make a ball of any shape with twenty percent shapes and eighty percent flat level. It doesn't pan out in any situation. No. Yeah, that's and that's why I don't focus on it, honestly. Um, I mean, this is this is for other people to you know, think about things differently and hopefully it, um, you know, pushes all this flat earth stuff much, much further. Um, so, yeah. The one thing I did uh, enjoy uh, with these guys on, uh, they were on uh, the Baby Truther show um, maybe a week ago, maybe two weeks ago. Uh, they were fighting with them guys. I didn't watch it very long because there's just too much drama going on. But uh one of the points that they did bring up is they said that there's another fixed star that does not move that's supposedly south. south. Um, don't recall what the name of that was, but supposedly there's a match to Polaris, yeah. which there should be, which there should be. Um, and well, they had I, don't, some I, I really don't it. know. Um, I've tried to look into that and... The stars are one of those funny things. I think most of it's optical. And so you just, I think it's a difficult sort of subject to, to work from. Um, yeah, I don't know enough about it, honestly. I th- I, I've said before that I think the, the stars are in the um, firmament, which would be this mm-hmm. part of this dome. And that their light doesn't actually manifest until it um sigma gets into... octanus it says sigma octanus is the southern pole star whose counterpart is polaris the current north star i like how it says the current to an observer in the southern hemisphere sigma octanus appears almost motionless and all other stars in the southern sky appear to rotate around it it is part of a small half hexagon shape so that was very interesting uh i had never heard that that was very interesting it makes absolute sense though because i mean um and it's also very interesting because this is a concept that has always been real hard for me to uh, work through and then you look at the dome and the top is positive well when you look at uh, uh heathen cosmology uh muspelheim is actually to the south and Niflheim is to the north. So the yeah, right. world of cold would be above us and the world of ice or, or the world of ice and cold would be above us and the world of fire and hot would be below us. Now, <clears throat> which is obviously contradictory to uh, the sun being above us. Okay. But then when you understand that we live in the Vesca Pisces, that's what this dome is. Uh, the very top 
circle is then the ice circle. So that's what would be our underneath. So underneath us, the, the, the dome underneath us, the bottom portion holding in the bottom waters would be your ice portion. And then conversely, the uh, other side, the hot side, the dome would be above us for that positive side where Muspelheim is supposed to be because then when as the two cross the the below side because we would live dead center where this uh, salt bridge line is so as the two things cross and we make a Vesca the bottom of the Vesca is the Niflheim and the top of the Vesca is uh, Muspelheim so that's really very interesting then um, when you look at that with that positive uh, uh, shield right there or uh, firmament, yeah, um, that would definitely absolutely match up to Muspelheim coming from the south and where the two collided and made the Vesca Pisces. The top of the Vesca should be positive and the bottom should be negative because Niflheim was uh, uh, the northern world and Muspelheim was the southern world. Oh, yeah. yeah okay. And we then also it's also have... very interesting. Uh, uh, who, who else was it that was it you and I that were just talking about this the other day that somebody the way they kept describing energy when it's electricity moving east and west. And that's very uh, okay. interesting. Yeah, yeah. I think. Um, yeah, I think um, Zach did that. But generally, I see this as like a toroidal field. So you can sort of see it here. It goes around or it would it would sort of spiral in. This would be your par Polaris sort of and down. So um, that's that you've got some a, really bad. You know, that looks like the worst smiley face ever now. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'm trying to rub it out. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so this this top portion would be the top half of the Taurus field. The bottom portion would actually be a lot lower than the Earth, and this this Earth portion here um, is like the the heart, you know, and that's why it's sort of got this representation of the heart, or Earth is a Earth is an anagram for heart, or whatever it is. Um, so, and that would be again when we're looking at the the Trinity side of things um you know this is you know, sort of the cross and then mercury is actually in that centerpiece well this is where well. you're going to get the triple cross so if you put the high cross up here this is where you're going to get the triple cross you know what you know what yep. figure out you know what i'm talking about yep okay. so then you're going to have up here where you have basically and if you match this up to a human being you literally have the anode and cathode we can rename that uh, into the cerebrum cerebellum and then yep. there in the center is where your pineal or your mercury sign is going to go and then as yep. it travels down your spine you're also going to hit this heart center which is where uh, earth is uh, and that's going to yep. be your heart center but then it's also going to have to keep going down lower like lucas just said quite a bit below and until it hits that groin area where in a human you have right testy and left testy or right ovary, left ovary, um, where we have that same setup where now we're on the goat side rather than the, the ram side. Um, and that's going to set up that polarity there. But in each area, each of these three, and this is why when you look at my tree of life, this top one, that's going to be your etheric eye. And then you're going to have your heart or your ego eye, which is your your bay. And then your root is going to be your villi eye. And each time you're going to have that little line that goes across the other direction because it's set up that side to side polarity there, not just the top and bottom polarity. Hmm. Definitely and, and you also... need to be able to make this drawing complete and then lay my tree of life over it. That will be so cool. Yep, definitely. And also there's reference to the sun and moon as, as like two eyes. And if you look at the, even the elements and what their actions do, they're all to do with light ones and moon is, is sort of like taking in light. It's got that dark side. It's, it's more um, direct in it's masculine. It's very direct in its way. It's operating it. It, you know, goes straight across. It's got a dark side to it. Whereas your, your feminine sun is very, um, 
it, it's quite different. It just radiates out. And so this is the, mm-hmm. the polarity in us as well, which is the left, left eye, right eye. And then they, ha- you know, say, you know, um, you've got your pineal or your, your third eye, which is just the, that point between those two you know, right hemisphere, left hemisphere, that sort of thing as well. So that mercurial, that third eye is is in between. And then also it's um, – Mercury is also known as terminus um, in um, some of the other uh, writings and things like that, the god terminus. And it was depicted as um, this sort of like a hole in the top of the head, so your, your top of your crown basically. And, you know, the dome structures where they'd have that sort of hole in the top of the dome structures, well, that, that point up here was the terminus point. Um, again, sort of relating to um, Polaris, but also the top of your head, which is the, the crown chakra or where you actually uh, leave your body when you die. <laughs> well, well so and then if uh, you were actually in, making this into a battery of. drawing... You would draw a little light bulb right there, it would make this a complete battery drawing because that's the thing yeah, that's yeah. missing in this system. You'd draw the little light bulb right there at Polaris, and that's where the charge, when you recharge the battery, if you were doing that from the outside, would happen. Or if you're stealing charge from the battery, like we do it in a house or whatever, mm. that would be that point. So it'd be the little bat, that would be where the little light bulb goes. Yeah, that's where they usually draw that light. That exactly. Um, but I also sort of yep. like to point out that, you know, in this sort of, well, battery system, because energy doesn't leave, um, that the operation or the, the output of the battery, like what would be your appliance um, of the battery is actually the sun. So it, it, the output of this is actually allowing the rest of it to operate. <laughs> so... Uh, is, is, yeah, just sort of clear that up a bit. Yeah, but you can see how they're in alchemical terms, they're overlaying, um, you know, these ideas of, um, you know, spiritual salt and all that sort of stuff, that that gradient again. And, um, you know, even putting the sulfurs up, up above, like I drew on before, where you have mercury at the at the earth here and then the salts below. So, you know, well, and that, that gradient too, is the polarization. Yeah, exactly. Instead of everything, but we've been saying that the sulfur's big gummy mix has now been polarized into a gradient. Mm-hmm. And also, like when you're looking at sulfurs and things like that, you're looking at the acidic side of things, and that's exactly what you need um, for these the operation of the anode and cathode as well. Is basically a uh, a higher acidic um, electrolyte to actually interact with these metals. Um, so that's that's exactly what you need. Um, so and and sulfur is mm-hmm. really interesting just on itself. I've shown before that sulfur is um, when you put it in a plasma state, it actually um, gives out sunlight the same you know, frequency range of sunlight, then you add the hydrogen in, you've got a full sort of spectrum. Um, so, yeah, even that's interesting. There's so, there's so much to it. It's, it's really, um, and, and even when you start to apply this to the, like you're applying it to, you know, that spiritual aspect of the chakras and um, those sort of things, but even when you apply it just to, um, normal body functions, which would be, you know, your, um, cell movement and things like that, then we're seeing correspondences. And in fact, like your world egg that they talk about, the cosmic egg, well, an egg is, is a cell. And so we're basically w- within yeah. a cell. And it's just sort of, we should, in general, and this is how I say it, we should be able to see um you know ourselves in our world and the operation of ourselves in our world so and and that's what i've been trying to point out definitely hello i apologize for the abrupt ending on the uh, bedtime stories 
uh, I had a uh, real wicked fog roll in and it knocked out my internet and then my uh, computer took crap. So I had to get that all done up and restarted. Um, and by then Lucas is back to farm work cause he's got to get that farm work in. Um, but we will be doing uh, another one here shortly and further fleshing out the uh, biochemical electrical world and uh, how all that works. So we'll continue working on it. And thanks for watching, guys. And new to the channel and something I'm highly honored to have, we we wrote uh, Danheim and asked if uh, they would let us use their music on our shows and uh, kind of explain to them what I have going on. And Danheim generously said, absolutely, do it. So my personal favorite band, here's Danheim.